Good morning, Trinity Baptist Church. Ooh, that, that sounded nice. Well, not that it doesn't ever, but it, it, it is good. And a good morning to you who are joining us online at home. I think we've got an uh, internet connection that's good and stable this morning. Of course, if I say that. But we can pray to that end anyway. But I do welcome you this morning. Let's stand as we celebrate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, with hymn number 161. Crown him with many crowns. Today we have just a few announcements. The first is a visual announcement. Anybody see anything different in the sanctuary today? Yeah, I, I'm, I hope you certainly did. And a special thanks to our decor committee consisting of Joan and Allison and Renata, who with the help of Enda, Ed and Brenda put those up last week. They are beautiful. I think there were eight purchased, and so this is half of them, or, or something like that anyway. So uh, we'll have these up for the next uh, few weeks, 
uh, next month and a bit as we move into the Easter season. So special thanks to those folks. This afternoon, there was a transition team meeting after church at my place. So bring your family and we will have a good time together. As, and I want you as a church body to be praying for us. We have some rather important decisions to make today. And so I'm going to ask that you pray for us. We'll, we'll pray for the team later as well. But uh, keep us in prayer. For the next three weeks, starting next Sunday, we plan to have Roy Spanago with us. Roy was, now, let me, let me think, I'm not 100% positive on, on this. I think he was a pastor at Cambrian Heights. Possibly at Richmond Hill. So his son is at Richmond Hill. Yes, okay, okay. Anyway, Roy has retired, and so I think it was uh, you, Gordon, that suggested that we have Roy in to help fill the pulpit. And so, as I said, Lord willing, we'll have Roy here for the next three weeks after this Sunday. Today, of course, we have a very special guest who isn't so much a guest. Uh, and that's uh, Gordon and Arlene Grieve. And Gordon will be giving us part two of a sermon series today. And it's such a delight to have you both back with us. It's just like that family. You, you, you can't tire of seeing. Now, when, when we go to see family, that's not always the case. But, you know, for you, it is. It is. Let's just open our time together in prayer and dedicate this service to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you so very much for what seems to be the gift of spring. Although, Lord, we do live in Calgary, and that can be a deceiving idea. But, Lord, I do thank you for the wonderful weather we have enjoyed the elimination of most of that snow on the ground. The warmer weather allows us to get out and enjoy creation far more than we perhaps could have before. Father, regardless of the weather though, I am so glad we can return to this place and worship together as a family of believers fellowshipping with one another, studying your word together, praising your name in word and in song. Lord, I pray that all that is said and sung and done today would be honoring to you and in your will. Father, now as we prepare to give our morning offering, I thank you for what you have also provided for us, for our living necessities. You have made us stewards of your abundance. We may not always feel like we are abundantly blessed, but, but we are. And Lord, may all that you give us be used wisely not just for ourselves, but for others around us. And today, as we give of our offerings back to you, that which you already own, I pray that they may be used by this place for the furtherance of your kingdom, for the proclamation of the gospel, for ministry to one another here, and outside. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
I'll invite you to stand once more as we sing two hymns. Hymn number 217, followed by 231. Oh, how I love Jesus, and then come, Christians join to sing. Let's thank you for standing. Before Gordon comes to give us the message this morning, let's have a time of prayer. A time of prayer for one another, praying for those needs that perhaps only you know about. I'll give you a few moments to do that, then I will join in and lead us together, shall we?
Heavenly Father, we've been singing about your Son. What you did when you gave him leave to come to us as a man. Put on human flesh. Live a perfect life. To become that perfect sacrifice for our sin. To take our place to pay the penalty we could not pay and survive in your presence. Lord, we look forward to the time when we will be able to praise you continually. Indeed, we can, we can praise you now and without ceasing the way we're supposed to be praying, but Lord, Perhaps I can only speak for myself, but that's such a hard thing for me to do in the here and now. But still, Lord, take my heart, take my thoughts throughout this hour, next hour, every day that's ahead of me and orient my thoughts on you. We are so grateful for what you have done for each one of us. Lord, we think of those who are in the Ukraine and Russia at this time. We think of believers and unbelievers alike going through such tremendous military conflict and at home oppression to be without to be threatened continually with loss of life or health or limbs or family Father I don't know how that will end I pray that it be ending soon and through negotiated diplomacy. Nevertheless, Lord, I, I do pray that the believers who put their trust in you would indeed stand firm in their faith and become a beacon, a witness to the truth of your gospel in the exercise of their daily living. Lord, I pray the same for, for us, but in their countries right now, that is particularly difficult. And we pray for them. Lord, we pray for governments around the world, including our own. Lord, you tell us in your word we are to pray for those who are and have authority over us. So Lord, we remember our prime minister, his cabinet, our MPs, those at the federal level, our premier, our MLAs at the provincial level, our mayor, our councilman at the municipal level. We pray for those who may be in charge of us at work, at school, at home, anywhere. May we give them the respect that you have said we are to give them. But help us to serve and obey them as if we were doing it to you, not for their merits 
but because we love you and because you asked us to do it. Father, we also remember the many churches around this world who have met already, who will be meeting later, and do so on a regular weekly basis. I pray for those congregations that may be feeling the same strain and difficulties that we have in our own. I pray for those leaders, those elders, pastors, and deacons. For those Sunday school teachers and small group leaders, Bible study hosts. Father, I pray that your church would be one. That the love we have for you and for each other would indeed proclaim to the unloving world around us that your gospel is true. That there is hope found in you. May we, how we by how we live, be that witness and proclaim to those around us of the truths found in your word. Lord, for the members within our church, well, Lord, I use the word members very loosely. <laughs> Lord, I, I think of Chris Taxis, who has been recovering from COVID-19. I think of Dudley, who just finished getting a pacemaker the last couple of days and how well he is doing. I thank you for that, Lord. I pray for, for Janet, for her, <laughs> for her ability to cope, for her stamina to keep going to look after Dudley. Even in those times when the dementia seems to take more of the man that she knows and knew. Lord, we remember Janet as well for the upcoming surgery she will have next month and the care that Dudley will receive from his family. Lord, we think of our own Sally Taylor, the different struggles, both medical and treatment struggles she has. Lord, I pray that you would give her comfort and meet every need as you have been. Nevertheless, Lord, we thank you. We praise your name. And pray to the end, Lord, that she would feel well enough to come and join us some Sunday morning. Lord, we remember our transition team, particularly today. I pray for unity among the team members as a decision will be made that could be significant. And I pray that you would give us oneness of heart, oneness of mind. Lead us, Lord, as we seek to do your will. Father, I thank you as I have already thanked you this morning for the privilege of gathering together and participating again as a family all together. I thank you for the lifting of the public health restrictions that had a tendency to isolate rather than promote togetherness. No judgment calls here, Lord. I'm just thankful for where we're at. And I pray for those who are still, still reticent. Lord, you move in their hearts. May we continue to enjoy the fellowship of togetherness here in this place. Lord, may our togetherness 
our love for one another, our love for you, our love for your word, be a very bright beacon to all those around us, be they already followers of you or not followers of you. May what we say and do be attractive. Lord, there's only so much you can do with this face, but perhaps with this mouth, with these hands, with these legs, we can represent your son to a world who does not know him. And be that warm welcome of invitation to get to know you. Lord, I'm so thankful that Gordon has been here last week and again this week. I pray that you, through your Holy Spirit, would speak the truth of your word into our hearts. May we leave this place changed. Closer to you, Lord. Firmly convinced that you are our only hope. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, good morning. Just double check. Is everything, there we are. Good. It is, uh, thank you once again, Paul. Thanks for the invitation, Diane, and others as well. It is great to be with you again this morning, and also really good to look out and see, again, some faces that I didn't see last week and some that I have not seen for a long time. So uh, really, really a delight to be here. Uh, why don't we pause and we'll pray. Paul has already but I always like to pray before I preach. So let's, uh, let's ask the Father to direct our thoughts. Father, we thank you again, Lord, for your word today. Father, thank you that your word is truth. And I do pray, Father, once again, that we will not only be informed, but that we will be transformed as we study, as we seek to follow. Father, thank you for the grace, the provision of your spirit who has inspired, Lord, these words, may you also now apply them to our hearts. And may we obedient, be obedient to you, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, as I get older, I think the subject of perseverance is something that I think about a lot more. I think of the issue of perseverance when I think of the challenges that churches are facing right now. I think of perseverance when I think of the leaders that I have opportunity to come alongside and coach. Uh, it's not an easy day to be a follower of Christ. And there are lots of things get, that could easily, if you like, cause us to maybe lose hope, get discouraged, or get sidelined, or perhaps maybe one way of picturing it, things that cause us to get into the ditch and, in a sense, get off the road. And what I want to think about today, it's really a, a continuation of what we started last week. We were talking about the topic of the idea of, of how do you get to the finish line? Uh, now, not just get to the finish line in the sense that you can say at the end of, end of the day, you know, I survived. Uh, it's not just a matter of survival, but really when I'm thinking of the finish line, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what image comes to your mind, but to me, the finish line is when you hear the words of the Father saying, you know, good job. Well done, good and faithful servant. You know, well done, Trinity. I don't know whether we'll have to give an account <laughs> as an entire congregation, I don't know. But, you know, wouldn't it, won't it be wonderful if we get to hear that? And that, to me, is the kind of finish line we're, we're talking about. How do we get there? Not just survival, but to get to the place where we really do uh, receive, and, and not only, in, if you like, the reward for our labors, but, but most importantly, that we get God's stamp of approval 
on the way that we've lived our lives. Uh, and so, in, t- in terms of faithfulness. Now, remember, we, we looked last week, if you weren't here or, didn't, or if you did see it online, uh, but if, you, if by chance you missed it, review is not always a bad thing. We looked at the account in Matthew chapter 3 of the baptism of Jesus and noted that, yes, there were some things about it that were very unique, obviously. Uh, Jesus only came one time at that point, right? So we understand there are, there are things about it that were unique and it, it authenticated who Jesus was in front of the people. Uh, he was shown to be the servant that Isaiah had prophesied would come. But we also saw that in some ways it also was a template and a picture of what we also have as children of God. We also have the gift of the Holy Spirit to empower us, to help to form uh, in us the character of Christ. Uh, in, in this, the Holy Spirit also, by the way, is a seal which guarantees our final inheritance. And so there's some, some overlap there. We talked about the idea of, an, of a secure identity when the Father says, you know, this is my beloved Son, and we all deal with identity issues. I mean, identity is is a trendy topic right now. And we might think of those who we say, well, you're trying to find your identity in all the wrong places, but the reality of it is, as followers of Christ, we sometimes are looking and try to find our identity in the wrong places, rather than who we are ultimately in Christ. And then we saw that just as the Father says to the Son, or says to everyone who's watching, this is my Son, whom I love, that Jesus, in the next three years, he lived his life, he taught, he did his miracles, he faced opposition, and he did all of these things knowing the smile of the Father. And I, and I just want you to think, and, and me to think this morning, am I living the Christian life fearing the frown of the Father, or with an awareness of the approval, the smile of the Father. Now, listen, we should never allow the smile of the Father to be an excuse for laziness or for falling into sin. It's a little bit like when Paul says, are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? God forbid, we die to sin. How can we continue to live that way? But I would just say, listen, the, the knowing and, the, and longing to live under the smile of the Father is, is a much, much great, greater motivator than living under the frown of the Father. Now, what I want to think about today is it sort of takes this a little further. Because we, we can learn in Scripture, yes, we learn from good, positive examples. You know, we think of the great cloud of witnesses in Hebrews chapter 11. But as you go through that chapter, we realize that some of the examples are really good examples, and some are, when you really dig in, we discover that they're not always the best examples. And Scripture gives us both positive examples to follow and also sometimes negative examples that are part of the fact that all Scripture is inspired of God and and profitable for correction, for training, and so on. And so this morning we're going to look at the same theme, but we are going to look at it from, if you like, an almost opposite perspective. And so I want to think about this morning, starting in one of the most familiar chapters of the Bible. It's a story we know so well, you almost may not even want to turn there because you almost have it memorized. But let me just illustrate, first of all, I don't know, anybody here remember the very first time you drove in the snow? Anybody remember that? Am I the only one? Okay, we have a few <laughs> like that. I, I hope your first experience was, was, was better than mine. Uh, the very first time, I was 16 years of age. I had had my driver's license not for a very long time. I don't want to embarrass Arlene, but this was long before I met Arlene. I had a girlfriend in Fort Langley that was about 15 kilometers from our farm in Aldergrove. And I wanted to go and just spend some time with her. So I am about to leave, and my dad you know, gave me the usual things. Uh, you know, be careful, the roads are slippery, and so on. And me and my arrogance said, listen, I know what I'm doing. I know how to drive in the snow. The reality of it, of it is I hadn't a clue. And literally about 200 yards from the home, our home, I'm already in the ditch. And I have, you know, very humbly had to walk back 
home, Dad had to get the tractor out and had to tow me out of the ditch. I never did get to Fort Langley that night. Now, when I'm thinking of it, what I want to think about today, I'm sort of using that analogy. When we talk about getting to the finish line, we not only learn from positive examples, but let's consider what are some of the things that can cause us, whether individually or even as a congregation, if you like, to get into the ditch, and how do we avoid it? Uh, and in some ways, we're looking at how do we get uh, how do we get in the ditch, and then how do we sort of realign ourselves in such a way uh, that we don't. So here we are. It's Luke chapter 15, and it's one of the most familiar stories. But it starts out like this. You know it well. Look at verses one and following. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Wouldn't you love it? If all of your non-Christian friends or people out there, the people who are really lost, were just coming around and, and honestly curious and wanting to know more. So here they are. They're gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law mutter, this man welcomes sinners, each with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Now, we, we know that the religious elite, the scribes, the Pharisees, the legal experts, the ones who knew the, the Torah, all of these, they were absolutely convinced that they were the ones who were on the right path. If you are on the right path, if you were on the road, you do things exactly the way that we do them. And they're looking at Jesus and they're saying, you know, Jesus is a false teacher. He's hanging out with the wrong people. If you like, Jesus is the one who's on the wrong path. And you see this note of conflict. Uh, that begins to develop. He's being criticized because of his associations. Now, a trick question. How many parables does Jesus give in Luke chapter 15? Just think about it for a moment. How many parables are there? Now, there are three stories. Do you remember that? First of all, what? You have the story of the peasant woman. She's got ten coins. And what happens? She what? She loses one. What else do you have? You have what? The shepherd got 90, well, he got 100 sheep, he loses one. Okay, 1%, the next one is 10%. You've got the father, and you've got the two sons. Now, how many parables are actually in the story? Go ahead. Okay, <laughs> typically we think three. Now, you're probably, some of you are trying to figure this out, but notice how it starts. We have all of these objectors, and then it says that Jesus told them this parable. It's, if you like, one play in three acts. They all are saying the very same story. And so you know what, what happened, of course. You've got the story of the shepherd and the 99 and so on, the one that's lost. But look at verse 7. Look at the outcome, what happens, what he finds in verse 7. I tell you in the same way, there's more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99. Notice righteous persons who do not need to repent. By the way, do you happen to hear any kind of a note of sarcasm? Okay. Is Jesus actually saying that the 99 that were in the fold had no need of repentance? I don't think so. In fact, as we go further in the story, we're going to see that that's the very point that he's trying to make. In other words, those that think they're on the path are actually not, and the one who is not is one that actually does finally get on the path now, take a look at the second story. The woman loses one of ten coins. Notice it's the very same theme. It's part of the parable, part of the story. What does she do? She loses one. Now, that, the, the loss is greater when you think of it percentage-wise, right? If you've got a hundred sheep, you lose one. That's a significant loss. But if you are poor and you've got only ten coins and you lose one, well, that's a significant chunk of change. And what happens? Verse 10. She finds it, gathers her friends, and they throw a party. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And then we get into the third, not third parable, but the third story or the third act. And of course, this is the one that we know very well. Father, give me my share of the estate. Now, we know it so well. We know that the son was disrespectful. We know that, in essence, he was saying, Father, I, I recognize that the estate is not distributed until death. And so, in a sense, he's saying, Father, in a sense, I'm almost wanting you to die, but I'm so impatient for your death. 
that I want my inheritance you know, right now. We also know that for the father to have to, in a sense, sell everything and be able to liquidate all of the assets and be able to distribute also would, in some respects, put the entire family estate in peril economically. And so it was something that was very costly and it was very disrespectful and shameful and all of these things. And of course, we know we went off to a distant country, wild living, the severe famine, he hires himself to a slave. We know that what does he end up doing? He looks after feeding of pigs, which of course for a Jew would be something that would be absolutely unclean. And so you've got all of these different things that are going on. Now, we tend to fixate on the prodigal son. If I were to say to you today, tell me the story of the prodigal son you would probably do the very same thing if you were to say to me, Gord, tell me the story of the prodigal son. And who would I tell you about? I would tell you about that guy that some of your versions say he what? He not only goes off to a distant country, but he spends himself in riotous living. It's a wonderful phrase. We can picture it. Now, I think... And many times I've done this, and, and I think we often do. We, how many evangelistic sermons have we heard on the text? How many times, I say, a youth leader, have I used this story as a way to illustrate how we can sort of get off the road and how we can get into difficulty and the consequences of sin and the, and the shame and the need to repent and return to the Father and all of that, which, by the way, is also very true. There's a lot of wisdom in that. Now, here's something that is a little bit challenging, and I'm not trying to be deliberately provocative, but I want us to think about this. We often say, and I often say, that, there, that sin is sin, and that, that, some, that really there are not worse and better sins, that all sins separate from God and all sins are significant. Now, I recognize that the consequences of certain sins can be much more destructive than others. I don't doubt that for a moment. But sometimes I know that I have fixated on this, and I have acted as if sexual sin is worse than all the other sins. We tend to see, we often tend to, to focus on the salacious part of the parable. We tend to focus on the wild living and think that that's the whole point of the story. But what I want us to recognize today is that is not the point of the story. Because, in fact, what was it that Jesus was doing? You see, as his listeners were listening, they were, Jesus does this often, he sort of draws you into the story and he gets you to agree with the story. And then he takes it and turns it in a different way that penetrates and, and exposes, in a sense, our own hypocrisy. Because what is Jesus doing? Well, his listeners are listening and they're probably nodding. And they're saying, Jesus, you were absolutely right. This scoundrel, this guy who's living this wild life and, and, and ultimately comes back to the Father, you know, he's the one that... That, that needs to be disciplined and beaten and all of these kinds of things. That would be entirely justifiable for the father to do it to him. And, and, and of course, then in their minds, they're also thinking, it doesn't make any sense because Jesus is speaking about this wild living young man. And then, but, but Jesus is the one who is actually befriending these and they're coming to him and there is this disconnect that they're probably trying to figure out. So what is the point? The key to understanding the story is in the preamble. The key to the story is in the introduction. Everything else simply draws us in and reinforces what Jesus is saying. And, and what is he doing? He's being accused of hanging out with the tax collectors and sinners. In other words, the point is this. Yes, we could say that, if you like, the slippery slope, self-indulgence, someone who wants to live a life of absolute freedom without consequences and just live according to their, his own desires with no regard to the family and all of these sorts of things. Yes, that is an example of, of what it means to be a prodigal. 
But the point that Jesus is making in the story is that there is more than one prodigal in the story. And that the one who is the worst prodigal, if we could, if we could say that, is not ultimately the son who goes off in a distant country and eventually returns home when he comes in want. But that the greatest prodigals of all were the ones who were criticizing Jesus because of his associations. Because what we discover is that as he goes on and speaks about the elder brother, the elder son, who was the dutiful one, in a sense, who's he representing in the story? He's representing the Pharisees, the religious rulers, who are rebuking Jesus because of his associations. And so who is the elder brother? Notice what happens when, when the younger son comes home and the father doesn't beat him but restores him, gives him once again the family ring, puts a robe on him and celebrates, and he calls everyone together. The elder brother's out in the field. He hears the party, the, he, the dancing, the music, and all of these things, and he comes home. And, and first of all, the father sends out emissaries and says, listen, would you come in and would you come and, and join in the party because your brother has returned? But notice how the older brother responds in verses 28 and 29. He becomes angry. He refuses to go in. His father goes out and he pleads with him and he says, Father, all these years I've been... Notice the words... Notice his understanding of his relationship with his father. Notice his understanding, if we think of it as believers, his understanding of the Christian life. All these years, I've been slaving for you, and I've never disobeyed your orders. You never even gave me a young goat so I can celebrate with my friends. By the way, is that true? No. The father said, listen, everything I have is yours. You've got it all. You can have had it any time you want. But notice that phrase. All these years I've been slaving for you. Never disobeyed. See, what is Jesus saying? He's saying that, you know, we may not land in the ditch of those who live the wild life. But what about self-righteousness? What about pride? What about thinking that I'm holier than someone else? What about legalism? Sometimes I know as someone who tries to work hard for God, how often what I work on, how often what I do is, is really based on human motivation. How much of it is truly based on knowing and loving God? And, and just out of joy and delight, in a response to the grace and the generosity of God, and how much of it is based on, on trying to perform. Again, as I mentioned last week, sometimes we who believe so passionately in the fact that we are saved through faith, it is a grace of God, not of works. How often we can be so works-oriented, either in how what we expect of ourselves or in what we expect of other people. And what Jesus is wanting them to understand is that we get off the road when we focus on our own performance and we lose sight of the character of the Father. Remember in, in Matthew 23, by the way, Matthew 23 is a, a very strong, stern, in a sense, commentary that further develops what he says here. It has all of these woes against the scribes and the Pharisees. And it includes things like it says how, you know, you, he said, you give a tenth of your spices. Listen, tithing is good. You give a tenth of your spices, but you neglect the more important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. Brothers and sisters, I, this is not Trinity. I, I'm looking at the evangelical church today, more so across the border, but do you realize that there are so many people that are just like you and me who think that messages or, or addressing issues of justice and mercy are somehow preaching something that is contrary to the message of the Bible. What does Jesus say? He says, look, we can do all of our religious duties, he says, but if we neglect issues of justice 
and mercy and faithfulness, we are not following the gospel. This is not in contrast. The gospel is, yes, what God has done for us. But listen, if we understand the grace of God, if we are people who are living with that sense of awareness of what it means to have been forgiven and, and, and what God has done to us. In other words, there, we ought to recognize that in the elder brother is the picture of how we can be living close in terms of proximity to the Father. But we can be so far from the Father's heart. You see, there's more than one prodigal in the story. The whole point that Jesus is making is that those who really know the Father, we want to be like Him. It doesn't excuse sin. It doesn't do any of these things. But it means that we reflect the Father's heart. We make friends with the tax collectors and sinners. We show compassion and grace. And we do everything that we can to bring people into the kingdom of God. Now, I want to take a look at one further story. If I were to ask the question and say, is there a prodigal son story in the Old Testament? There are probably many you could think of. We could think of Abraham, right? How Abraham is trying to figure out how is he going to get an heir? <laughs> He's old, his wife is old, so what does he do? He tries to figure it out for himself. We have Jacob. We have David. What about Jonah? I mean, Jonah's a great prodigal son story of the Old Testament. But there's one that I'm thinking of that if you have been at Trinity for a while, and most of you have, you'll probably recognize it's one of my favorites, and it's actually Psalm 73. It's the story of Asaph. And I would suggest that Asaph, there's some very interesting overlap. In Psalm 73, by the way, Asaph was a worship leader. It's shocking to think how someone who is a leader of worship in the temple could get so far off track and almost walk away from his faith. But notice what he says. God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. If he'd only stopped there, that would have been okay. But notice what it says. As for me, my feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold. What happened? I envied the arrogant, when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. He goes on and he talks about, in very exaggerated words, in a sense, how good people who are not believers are doing. And here he's been serving God. In other words, he has this feeling almost of entitlement. The sense that God is letting other people off the hook, and here I am, I stay with the ship, and I do everything I'm supposed to do. In other words, I'm like the elder brother. I do my duty. I don't live a wild life. But it seems to him that God is treating him unfairly. Now, by the way, the scriptures allow us to question God. The scriptures allow us sometimes to complain against God. But the scriptures never let us stay there. And as Asaph, these thoughts are ruminating in his mind. Look at verse 13. He says, surely in vain have I kept my heart pure. In vain have I washed my hands in innocence. Notice when I try to understand all this in verse 16, it was oppressive to me until I entered the sanctuary of God. Then I understood their final destiny. He has an encounter with God in worship. God sets him straight. He realizes the true value. It's like the, the, you know, the pearl hunter. It's like the fellow looking for treasure. And when he finally recognizes and he sees this pearl of great price or he discovers this treasure, what does he do? He's willing to sell everything else and he buys the field. Why? Because he realizes the incredible value of what he has. And look at verse 24 and 25. He, he has a new sense, by the way, of the destiny of the wicked, and God will vindicate the righteous. And then he says, you guide me with your counsel. Afterward, you take me into glory. And then what? Whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing 
that I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I mentioned the farm that where I first drove into the ditch. We also had black Angus cattle. Now, Angus cattle, their heads are a little smaller than other beef cattle. And we had a lot of paved wire fence. And, and typically what they would try to do is they would stick their noses in, in the paved wire. And then they would begin to stretch it a little more and a little more and a little more. And then they'd manage to get a shoulder in through the wire. And then they'd kind of wiggle around a little bit. And eventually that little square of page wire would continue to expand and expand. And eventually they'd get a foot in. And then they would begin to get out on the road or they would get into the neighbor's pasture. Listen, we did everything we could to provide for our cattle. But it was the myth of the greener grass. It was the sense that somehow they were being deprived. They were being robbed. You know, the beginning sometimes of our own falling into the ditch. Not in the sense of losing our salvation. But how does it begin? Yes, we can fall into the ditch because we do what the, you know, the younger, wasteful, Son did. Wild living and so on. But you know, I'm looking out right now at some beautiful people and I don't recognize a whole lot of wild living people in our congregation this morning. But then there is the elder brother and I know that there is that tendency in me and I think sometimes there can be a tendency like that in churches where we work hard, we do all the right things. But sometimes we can miss the fact that God is, ultimately all of this is of grace. All of this is a gift. Everything is ultimately what God has given. And the more that we live and understand that, we do it because we love Jesus. We love his people. And we are just so, in, in, if you like, just blown away by the lavish grace and love of, and generosity of our Father. Or we can be a little bit like Asaph, and sometimes we're sort of looking around and we're looking over our shoulder and we're thinking that God is being better and kinder to others, but somehow we got missed. That beautiful old hymn, Count Your Blessings, name them one by one and what? It will surprise you what the Lord has done who, what, forgives all of your sin. Bless the Lord, O my soul. You think of Psalm 103, and the more that we, the more that we take time to reflect and to recall and, and, and to remember, and as Asaph goes into worship, and once again, he, he sees the sacred furnishings in the temple that remind him of God's deliverance of the people through perils in the past. And he looks back and he realizes what God has done and he realizes what God has given to him. And he comes to recognize that he has a treasure that no one can take away. If my treasure is my health or my family or my money or anything, all of that is going gonna, gonna to be gone. But there is a treasure that we have in Jesus. And you see, that's what, the, that's what Jesus was wanting his listeners to get. That ultimately, what they now had in him was something that was so incredibly valuable. There's another hymn that includes this very poignant statement, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. There is within me, and I think probably within many, a tendency to wander. 
We may not wander in the extreme way of the prodigal son, the usual prodigal, but we can wander from the heart of God like the elder brother. Or sometimes we can wander and we do it through ingratitude because we fail to recognize the immense blessings of God in our lives. Sometimes it takes horrific things to bring us back. And we look at what's going on in Ukraine and we start to recognize that the demand for things, and this sounds political, and yes, it might even be, but we start to recognize that our demand, our insistence on our personal rights and freedoms, and the way we understand it in Canada, and the way we try and express it, just seems to be so trivial in comparison to what people around the world are facing and the price that they are willing to pay for their freedom today. Brothers and sisters, we are free in Christ. We have a treasure in Jesus that no one can take away. And that is what unites us. That is what should delight us. Anything else, honestly, anything else causes the church to slide into the ditch and makes us like the Pharisees and the scribes that Jesus was addressing. And it makes us utterly ineffective in representing him to the tax collectors and sinners who are willing to listen if we are willing to love and willing to reach out to them and willing to model something that is different, something that is attractive, something that truly represents the lavish grace of God. You see, the good news in this story is that we've talked about three prodigals, but there is one prodigal that we haven't addressed. Because the greatest prodigal of all is the father. And you might say, wait a minute, Gord, are you off your rocker? If you take a def- basic dictionary definition and say, okay, what is prodigal? It includes words like wasteful, lavish, generous. And yes, it includes all the negative stuff, too. But you see, the whole point of the story, and the good news for us who wander, is that the Father's prodigality exceeds our own. The Father is always waiting at the window. The Father is looking for the slightest evidence of a heart who is turning around and returning. And the good news is this, that the Father's willingness sometimes to forgive, even exceeds our own desire and readiness to be forgiven. Because ultimately this story is about the prodigal father. The father who, in a sense, wastes his love and his grace on prodigals like me. And like us. And as we align ourselves with the Father's heart, we will be able to reach out and draw others in because they will come to know the love of God, all of which was made possible through the cross of Christ. The cross is never mentioned in the text, but we understand now how it is that the Father could be waiting at the window. How it is that the Son could return and be received, it is only because of the fact that God sent Jesus. He was the one who was sinless. He was the one who gave it all 
He was the one who bore the penalty. And because of that, we are forgiven. And we can come back as wanderers to the heart of the Father. Let's pray. Father, prone to wander. Lord, we feel it. Prone to leave the God we love. But Father, thank you. Thank you, Father, that you receive us because of Christ. We can return to you. And you will never, ever cast us aside. Father, I pray for us. I pray for this congregation. Father, that in all of our relationships, both within and without, that people will see the beauty of Jesus in us. And in his lovely name we pray. Amen. Take your hymn books. Turn to hymn number 412. Asaph said, There is none that I desire on earth besides you, Lord. Where are you looking? Is it in your works? Or is it in the Lord Jesus? Where's your value? Let's turn our hearts toward him. My faith has found a resting place. I trust the ever-living one. His wounds for me shall plead. Let's stand as we sing. to do immeasurably more than all we can ask or imagine. According to his power that is at work within us, he is the one 
who will give you all that you need because your sufficiency is in Christ. To whom alone be glory, power, majesty, and dominion, both now and forever. Amen. God bless you all.